I'm just going to speak loudly because I'm not going to speak for very long. Dr. Dalton will be mic'd, so you'll be able to hear him. He's the one we want to hear. Um, <laughs> so welcome everyone to another Coffee and Culture. Um, it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome the Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeological Society um, that uh, has partnered with us to bring um, archaeological themed <laughs> presentations to the rooms. Um, and we're very grateful to the, to the partnership. I'm going to pass it over to um, Tim Ratz, who is an archaeologist himself, um, a flint knapper, has worked uh, throughout the island, Labrador, up in the Arctic. Um, and he's going to introduce our presenter this afternoon, um, who is Dr. Barry Dalton, and uh, enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, yeah, my name is Tim Rast. I'm the current president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeological Society, and uh, we feel really privileged to be co-presenting uh, co uh, Dr. Dalton today with uh, the rooms uh, as part of their Coffee and Culture series. The Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeological Society is, is quite a new organization. We uh, incorporated in 2013, and the idea is that we're trying to bridge the gap between the professional archaeological community the, uh, the academic archaeologists at the, at, in the department at Memorial University and the general public. The, uh, the society is open to everybody. It's not a, uh, it's not a closed professional association. It's, it's intended to be open to, to anybody with an interest in archaeology in the province. And uh, so, so presentations like this, skills workshops, uh, these are the sorts of things we're trying to, to put together and, and uh, just uh, spread the stories of some of the really interesting archaeology that's going on in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, I, uh, I originally, I moved here in 1996 from Alberta and one of the very first people I met was, uh, well he wasn't Dr. Barry Galton at the time, he was another grad student in, at Memorial University. And I remember, I think it was one of the first times I met him, he was just getting back from Placentia where he and a friend uh, had been doing a survey and it's a quite a long story but basically they got swept a long ways up the sea and he's lucky to be alive and, uh, <laughs> and at this point i was new like all i knew about newfoundland was what i read about Grenfell on the ice and then i meet this guy and it's like oh my god does this happen to everybody <laughs> um, so since then barry finished his uh, his ma he went on to do a phd he was he was the first phd at uh, in the Department of Archaeology uh, here at, at Memorial, and uh, he graduated, he finished his PhD in 2006 and became an associate professor uh, the same year when Dr. Jim Tuck uh, retired, who was going to be one of the three men that he's he's speaking about this evening. Barry's uh, made his career at Fairland, studying the 17th century. Um, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about uh, about that career and some of the. the the man and the, the work that has, has, has gone on there. So uh, please welcome Dr. Barry Dalton. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thanks, Jillian, as well. Uh, just a little bit of background on that story. I, uh, I both love and hate that story. I often wonder what would have happened to me in life if I actually made it as far as St. Pierre in that boat. <laughs> anyways, uh, we did get saved, after all, after a few of the mishaps. But uh, yeah, a great little story about the two grad students who didn't have a clue about what to do on a boat in a dory in the uh, Placentia. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's it for that. My presentation today, yes. OK, I lost my train of thought. I'd like to start by introducing you guys to three very important individuals. And the first is Sir George Calvert, the first Lord of Baltimore. In 1621, George Calvert establishes a permanent English settlement on the southern shore of Newfoundland's Avalon Peninsula, right here at Fairfield. <laughs> so he's our important person, number one. Number two is Sir David Kirk. In 1637, David Kirk is granted rights to the entire island of Newfoundland in a grant issued by King Charles I. And the following year, in 1638, Sir David Kirk, his wife, Lady Sarah Kirk, and around 100 settlers, they arrive at Fairyland, they displace the Calvert's residing governor, take up residence in Calvert's own house, and essentially take over the plantation for themselves. And they remain at Fairyland until 1696, the various members of the Kirk's. Last, but certainly not least, is Dr. James A. Tuck who first became interested in the 
history of Fairland starting in the late 1960s. Jim initiated uh, small state, small scale testing uh, on site in the uh, mid 1980s, and starting in 1992, he initiated long term continuous excavations, which have actually uh, continued right up until the present. Jim did retire from Memorial in 2006, but he actually remained very active in the Fairland Archaeology Project up until just a few years back uh, when he retired and uh, moved back. Officially retired, unofficially retired, moved back to Martha's Vineyard, uh, and still doing very well. So this presentation today is about these three very important <coughs> individuals and the impact that they have had on the community of Fairyland, as revealed by close to two and a half decades of ongoing archaeological research. Now, in terms of the uh, early colonial history of Fairyland, it all it all begins around October fourth. 1621. And on this day, a group of 12 settlers, headed by the colony's first governor, Captain Edward Wynn, they arrive at Fairland and they begin construction on Sir George Calvert's colony of Avalon. The place where they chose to settle and to build is in the lands around Fairland's sheltered inner harbor or pool, located as you can see right here. Now, George Calvert, he he envisions this colony as a base for the lucrative cod fishery. He sees it as an expansion of England's overseas empire, and later he sees it as a place, as a home for both himself and his family, and also, very importantly, as a place of religious toleration. George Calvert envisions this place as a location where all Christians, Catholic and Protestant, should be able to worship freely without their persecution. Now, based upon the few surviving documents we have relating to early fairyland, trust me, they are very, very few. Based upon those documents, we know that in the first two years of settlement, the colonists constructed a dwelling, a modest dwelling, of 44 by 15 feet, and you can see it here revealed through archaeology. They also built a kitchen, a parlor, a tenement. They constructed a forge or blacksmith shop, and here's a rendition of the blacksmith shop right here. Obviously a very important building in, in early colonial North American contexts. The colonists also dug a 16-foot well. Uh, they built a wharf, and they also, in 1622, prepared ground for a brew house and other tenements. In 1627, George Calvert has his first opportunity to come and visit his pleasure and settlement, and what he sees no doubt pleases him because in the following year, he decides to return here along with his wife, much of his family, and around 40 additional settlers. Some of you may know what happens next. There was a bitterly cold winter in 1628 and 1629, and George Calvert later writes uh, from Ferryman stating that of the 100 persons residing at Ferryman, 50 were sick at a time, myself, being one of them, and he later goes on to say that nine or ten uh, of the residents perished. So about ten percent of the population uh, perished over that winter, that bitterly cold winter of 1628-29. George Calvert also writes King, writes King Charles I, uh, and he talks about Newfoundland winters. It's somewhat of a famous uh, phrase now, or a statement with regards to Newfoundland winters. He says, quote, from the middest of October to the middest of May, the sad face of winter upon all of this land, and the earth so intolerably cold that it's hard to be endured. And of course, we're feeling it even today. So, uh, yeah, George Calvert's from Yorkshire, and he's not really used to Newfoundland winters like we are. So, he decides that this is enough. So, George Calvert and his family depart Fairland. They begin to seek lands further south in what was the Dominion of Virginia, but they do maintain the plantation and they keep a loyal representative at Fairland to maintain the daily operations. Now, based upon these very scant bits of historical evidence, we actually know very little about the overall development of the plantation, the layout of the colony. We know precious little about the day-to-day -day life at Fairland. And this really is why the ongoing archaeology is so important and so informative. It gives us a much more comprehensive, holistic understanding of what actually took place here in Newfoundland throughout the 17th century at Fairland. So the archaeology is really helping to uh, provide such a valuable perspective and an important and a true perspective of what took place here. Let's give you a few examples. 
the brew house in Bay, or the brew house that Captain Wayne talked about breaking ground for in 1622, archaeology has shown that it's not just a brew house, but it turns out to be a combination brew house and bakery uh, as well. And here it is, here you can see uh, revealed during excavations. You can see the large fireplace, of course, and there's these two large upright slates in the center, likely for holding the large copper or kettle for brewing. And sure enough, in the corners of the fireplace, we found this large clay oven. There was another one there, not in such great shape, but this is where the uh, baking activities took place. So the brew house was actually, in fact, a combination brew house and bakery. And bread and beer, as uh, Art Klausmister will tell you, who did his MA on this project, bread and beer are two of the main staples of the 17th century English diet. I mean, to be honest, they're two of the main staples of the 21st century Newfoundland diet. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, this is the place where both the bread and the beer was prepared uh, for the early colonists in the 1620s. The water necessary for all that brewing and to a lesser extent the baking was actually quite ingeniously acquired by means of a 12 foot deep wooden well built right alongside that same structure so they had their own dedicated water source for the brewing uh, of the beer at the colony and any kind of liquid spills or mishaps which you would expect would happen in a, in a brew house and bakery they were quickly whisked away by means of this underground so the drainage system right underneath the brew house and bakery. So very clearly, this is just one example of how well laid out, how well planned, and how well thought out this early colony was, and the structures in that colony as well. In the early 1620s, Governor Wynn and the early colonists, they also embarked upon a, a very ambitious project, which was to forever change the landscape of 17th century Fairyland. And what they did is they dug into the hillside here to the south, and you can see these massive cuts into the hill. They dug in to make level land upon which to build. They took that same earth from the south end of the village, brought it here to the north end on what was once a gently sloping beach, and reclaimed land at the north. So there was this massive, truly massive, cutting and filling episode in the early 1620s. At Ferryland. It's even even more impressive when you consider that these individuals had to do this by hand and move the dirt and the rocks by cart. No, obviously, no uh, major uh, uh, equipment back in the 17th century. So, all done by hand. To protect that newly reclaimed land, the colonists also built this massive stone wall. To date, we have about 320 feet of that stone wall exposed. And again, this served to both retain the earth and when you look at it from a different perspective, or a different angle, that same stone wall served as the colony's quayside or quay. So this is a place where small ships could moor up right up to the Fairland colony, offload provisions, and also load upon things such as salt fish and train oil and any other products which were produced by the early colonists. So again, it's a there was a massive, massive undertaking by those colonists in the early years at Fairland, and no real inkling that this took place at all based upon the historical records. On the east end of the settlement, Governor Wynn talks about building a face of defense to the waterside ward, basically to protect the village. Archaeology has shown that this face of defense, again, was another really massive undertaking. It's a 20-foot wide ditch by 20-foot wide rampart fortification. So they dug the ditch, took the earth from the ditch, and threw it back here to the west to make a 20-foot wide rampart. Uh, in places as well, they faced it in stone along both the scarf wall and also the counter scarf wall. So again, huge amounts of effort, huge amounts of labor uh, went into the construction at this early village. At the far eastern, or sorry, at the far southern side of that very same ditch, we actually found the remnants of the bridge, whereby people crossed from the ditch and entered into the village proper. As soon as you cross the bridge, you would actually start walking on the colony's central street or main street. And Governor Wynne talks about building, or, or, or building two rows of buildings and connecting them together by means of a pretty street. This is the remnants of that same pretty street. It's a cobblestone pavement, it's 13 feet wide, and to date, at the eastern extent of our excavation, we have about 40 feet of that cobblestone street exposed. You can see how beautifully well made it is. Exactly 400 feet away at the western end of the village, right over here, we found the very beginnings of that same cobblestone street, 13 feet wide. So if we were ever to have the opportunity in the future to be able to peel back the modern pool road, we could walk that full 400 feet from one end of the village to the other. The same cobbles that the Calverts walked on, that the Perks walked on, and everyone else uh, in, from that, or in, in Fairland in the 17th century. 
when you look at these remains, I mean, if there was ever any doubt based upon the historical record, the archaeology clearly shows, I mean, this place was built to last. It was built with permanence in mind, for sure. So there's, there's absolutely no doubt anymore in terms of Calvert's vision for a permanent English settlement here in Newfoundland. Now, as for where George Calvert and his family lived uh, when they first came to Fairyland to live on a permanent basis in 1628-29, we always assumed, archaeologists, historians, we both assumed that the Calverts lived in that small 44 by 15 foot dwelling, which was mentioned in the early documents from Fairyland. The reason why we all thought they lived in this house is because there was no other historical reference to anything else being constructed. Uh, larger than this early dwelling. So this is where we all thought the Calverts lived in and the Kirks lived in. The archaeology has totally turned that around. This is where the Calverts and the Kirks lived in in the 17th century. This quite substantial series of interconnected domestic structures and outbuildings and pavements and courtyards. Beyond a doubt, these are the structures which are later referred to in the documents as the mansion house. And these are the same structures which Kirk took over when he first came in 1638. Not this very small, sorry, 44 by 15 foot structure, but this quite massive interconnected series of stone buildings. At the heart of it all, and this, and this is also centrally located right in the heart or core of the Fairdale village. Uh, at the heart or core of the domestic compound is this 23 by 36 foot stone hall, and this is the main living chambers uh, for the Calverts and their family. And the front door is right here, and this leads right to a private cobblestone courtyard. The cobblestone street is actually right around here somewhere. And right in behind that courtyard, another large two-room stone structure, a two-bay outbuilding. At the back, here's the kitchen. So this is where the servants prepared the meals and cooked the meals for the Calverts and their family. After it was prepared, they would go out a door here, walk along a little cobblestone pavement, right to the second floor, eating and living chambers uh, in the hall. So really ingenious, ingeniously built and well laid out. Uh, the northern structure of that, that two bays uh, outbuilding here, this was a buttery or a pantry or a cold room where all the provisions uh, for the Calvers were also kept. At the east side of that uh, same stone hall, the Calverts uh, had their horses and their livestock and any other um, creatures kept in the winter in this stable. So a stable specifically built for the Calvert's livestock right alongside the, uh, the hall. And at the north, there were two timber frame buildings, domestic buildings with large fireplaces, one of which is the remnants of that 44 by 15 foot structure. These could have served either for additional uh, living quarters for the extended family of the Calvert's or possibly even for the servants uh, as well. So when you look at this, there's a, it's a huge interconnected series of structures as opposed to just that small little 44 by 15 foot dwelling. Now again, at the harbor core of that compound is the hall of the mansion. So it's 23 feet, like I said, 23 wide, 36 long. Uh, the stone walls are, are two and a half feet thick. It was plastered on the inside of the structure. It had a, a timber floor. You can see the remains of these floor joists here, just simple dark stains. These represent floor joists, a massive fireplace at the lateral end of the building with a nice brick hearth. And just like the brew house I told you about earlier, this also has an underground drainage system to help to uh, facilitate any kind of water runoff that, that came from the south, uh, from this hillside right here to the south. Now, just last summer, we actually had our first opportunity to excavate in the actual builder's trench associated with Calvert's Mansion House. So the actual builder's trench dating specifically from the 1620s when this structure was built. Quite unsurprisingly, we found lots of construction debris, so we found uh, lots of sand and lots of lime, of course, to make mortar for some of the walls. We found slate for both the roofing material and also for the walls, and we found a bunch of uh, window glass as well, obviously, uh, for the windows of the dwellings. Oops, that scared everyone, sorry about that. Uh, quite, surpri quite surprisingly, we found lots of bone in amongst that same builder trench deposit, mostly fish, mostly codfish but also a small percentage of bird and some mammal as well. And, and we believe these represent the remains of the meals taken by the former craftsmen who were working on these structures for the six or nine or 12 months or 18 months it took to actually erect all these buildings. So these are the remnants of the meals of the, of the masons and the slaters and the, and the quarrymen and the carpenters who were working on, on Calvert's mansion house. 
In that same deposit of bone, we also found some evidence for another of Fairyland's early colonists in the form of several rats. And uh, you can see here the, the bones themselves are in a fantastic uh, state of preservation. Part of the reason, or a large part of the reason, has to do with all of that lime in the soil, changes the pH and preserves the, the final material. But also we're in the habit, uh, the last 20 odd years, of wet screening most of our 17th century deposits through a one millimeter mesh. So when you wet screen through a one millimeter mesh, you get the ribs, you get the foot bones, you get the tail bones. We're in the, we're in the business of maximum recovery. So you get all these tiny little pieces, which you normally won't get through a quarter inch dry screen uh, technique. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it makes for a nice picture if, if for nothing else in this case. In that same builder's trench deposit from the 1620s, we found I guess what could be best described as probably our most important artifact in certainly a half dozen or more years, this tiny little copper crucifix, which once formed part of a Catholic rosary. Uh, it's very, very tiny, as you can see right here. It's only 2.8 centimeters across, and on the front it bears a very simple representation of the crucifixion, and on this side, on the back, an equally, if not more so, crude depiction of the Virgin Mary uh, and Christ child. Now remember, like I said earlier, that George Calvert, he envisioned this settlement uh, as a place of religious toleration. He wanted it to be a place where all Christians, Catholic and Protestant, would be able to worship freely without fear of any persecution whatsoever. Back in England, of course, things were different at the time. Catholics could be fined, they could be uh, imprisoned, they could be occasionally put to death in extreme cases for openly practicing their religious faith. Here in Avalon, this is not what Calvert wanted. Calvert was a visionary and he wanted religious toleration and peace between all the colonists. So this artifact is a direct physical representation of that toleration. It's a Catholic object in an essentially Protestant English colony in the New World. And so you know, so it's an important religious artifact and it's an important historical artifact as well. And it brings us back to that you know, early time in Canadian history when people, forward thinking people like George Calvert, is preaching toleration and peace. Now, even though George Calvert departs Fairland in 1629, things, things really start to get interesting again when David Kirk and his family show up in 1638. David Kirk was a merchant, and much of his plans for Fairland revolved around making money. So shortly after David Kirk arrives, he begins to impose a 5% tax on all foreign fishing ships, flying Newfoundland's waters, he charges local residences rents on their fishing rooms, and he charges people licensing fees to operate taverns. And in 17th century Newfoundland, there was lots of fishing rooms and lots of taverns. So David Kirk made all sorts of money uh, when he was here in Newfoundland. The archaeological evidence is also showing that, you know, within a few short years of David Kirk's survival, there was a major reorganization of facilities right here at Fairyland. So within a couple of years, that brew house and bakery, which I told you about earlier, this was essentially dismantled. And in its place, the Kirk's build a house. The forge, or blacksmith shop, again, another very important structure for early European settlements. This was abandoned altogether. And that stable, which was right alongside the mansion house, that was torn down and right at top of it, David Kirk built a tavern, which he himself operated. So, I mean, all these structures, which are very important functions in George Calvert's colony of Avalon, they really no longer seem to have a purpose in the mercantile, business-oriented plantation of Sir David Kirk. So again, a real change that's visible archaeologically between both proprietors. Soon after David Kirk arrives, he also begins to mint his own local currency. And of course, it's made of lead, and you can see David Kirk's own initials there. Uh, today, we found three different sizes, three different denominations. The fact that they're made right here in Newfoundland makes these coins, the earliest known coins minted in what is today Canada, if not the earliest known minted coinage in all of in colonial North America. So very important, certainly uh, numismatic pieces uh, for early uh, Canadian European history. Despite the fact that Sir David perishes in 1654, his wife, Lady Sarah Kirk, and their four sons, George, David II, Philip and Jarvis, they all stay on at Fairyland after Sir David's death. They continue the family's business operations, focusing on both fishery and also on trade and provisioning. And we found all sorts of artifacts 
uh, pertaining to the Kirks in the second half of the 17th century after Sir David's death. And these artifacts tell us that the Kirks still remained wealthy, still remained well connected, and still remained essentially uh, the gentry in 17th century Newfoundland. Probably the best single example I can give you is this here. We found a collection of about a dozen king laced plates and bowls, all of them on the inside bear the initials SK for Sarah Kirk, of course. After a bit of research, we figured out that these tin glazed plates and bowls were produced sometime after 1660, so long after Sir David's death. They were produced in Villanova in Portugal. And we believe they were commissioned by a Portuguese merchant, shipped to Fairland as a gift for Lady Sarah Kirk, and this was essentially used as a means to either cement or secure uh, business partnerships between uh, an old world merchant and a new world fishing uh, planter such as, as Lady Sarah Kirk. So for those of you who don't know much about Lady Sarah Kirk, she's also uh, believed to be one of the most successful female entrepreneurs in, in 17th century Canada, if not at all 17th century North America. So a very important um, individual in terms of 17th century colonial history. And here's her own fancy plates and bowls. We also found a collection of bottle seals from glass wine bottles, and the initials, of course, you can see are PK. We believe these are the bottles once belonging to Philip Kirk. Philip Kirk was the third son of Sir David and Lady Sarah. And these PK bottle seals, some of them were associated with yet another dwelling built by the Kirks in the second half of the 17th century. This house may have been lived in by just Philip Kirk, or it may have been Philip Kirk and his other brother, uh, David II. So again, the house and the seals also associated with the curves. Probably the single most uh, impressive object that we found to date at Fairyland associated with the Kirk family are these set of solid gold seals. They're actually, they actually form three separate units. There's a small one, a mid-sized one, and a large one. They all hinge together to form a single piece, and here they are sitting atop Jim Tuck's index finger just to give you a perspective of how tiny, yet how intricate and how beautiful these things are. Uh, on the bottom of each, of course, is a single stamp or seal matrix. Here they are right here. And again, uh, positive impressions in dental plaster. This one here, the smallest, is a religious symbol. Uh, it's a winged and flaming heart sitting on a pedestal. This mid-sized one is referred to as a trophy of arms, and a trophy of arms is meant to commemorate a military victory. Uh, typical sim uh, symbolism on these things include a helmet and shield along with some spears and pole arms. And certainly for my money, the best of the three is the largest, which shows the Kirk family coat of arms. Uh, not just the Kirk family coat of arms, but the coat of arms, which includes this very important augmentation or addition. In heraldry terms, this is known as the canton. This canton was awarded to David Kirk and his brothers in 1631 by King Charles I, essentially in recognition of the Kirk's capture of Quebec from Samuel de Champlain and in recognition of the Kirk boys' victory over a French naval fleet in the year prior to the capture of Quebec. So David Kirk and his brothers were granted that augmentation or addition, and lo and behold, there it is on that same set of solid gold seals uh, that we found at Fairland. Now, as for how it got lost in the ground at Fairland, well, chances are it's probably associated with this particular event here. On um, September 21st, 1696, a large contingent of soldiers and nine French warships arrive at Fairyland. They encircle the settlement. There's a very brief skirmish. And afterwards, the French, quote, burnt all their houses, household goods, fish, oil, train bets, stages, boats, nets, and all of our fishing craft. The vast majority of residents at Fairyland were actually unharmed, put on board ships, and sent back to Appledore in Devon. However, those who were deemed worthy of ransom were not sent back to England. Instead, they were sent to the French stronghold at Placentia. Among those in prison were the three surviving Kirk boys, uh, George, David II, and Philip Kirk, all three of whom perished over that winter of 1696-97. Whoops. Now, archaeological evidence for that very brief attack on Fairyland, uh, it's visible, very visible in the form of burnt house floors, thick layers of charcoal, collapsed walls, collapsed roofing material, and this is quite a spectacular example right here. There's a large impact crater right in that cobblestone pavement just outside the hall of the mansion house, and sure enough, when we dug down into that impact crater, this pretty big piece of iron bar shot. For those of you who know about 
develop iron bearish shut, it's typically used in naval campaigns to, to take out the riggings of ships so it whirls around and makes an awful noise and frightens everyone. Uh, it's used in naval campaigns. In Fairland, in this instance, I can't imagine it being used to take out ships. It was likely just lobbed into the colony to scare the Jesus out of everyone. And it never worked. It was, a, it was a short skirmish and equally short and quick surrender. So uh, this is some of the munitions that were used by the French, basically, in the attack on Fairland in 1696. During that same event, someone had the opportunity to hide a small collection of their valuables just in the floorboards, just outside that house, right about there. And sure enough, when we excavated the floor of that structure, we found seven silver coins all, all together, fairly large denomination pieces, uh, shillings and half crowns mostly. We also found two finger rings associated with the same cash. One is a gold stone ring. Essentially, this is glass with little bricks of gold. The other is an actual gold ring with a pewter vessel containing uh, semi precious stones. Now, the historic record tells us that there were no casualties as a result of the French attack in 1696. True enough. However, archaeology paints a slightly, slightly different picture. This female dog is the only real known casualty of the French attack on Fairland in 1696. We actually found her in amongst the rubble uh, from the buttery pantry building I showed you earlier. Because of all the mortar from the construction of that building, her skeleton was preserved in a beautiful state of preservation. Even her claw cores uh, were preserved in there. Sure enough, when we examine the skeleton, you can see her tibia here. Real classic entry and exit wounds in the tibia, so some shot passed through there. And there's two pieces of lead shot performed and still embedded uh, in her bone. So, so based upon this bit of evidence, you know, we can come to the conclusion that she likely was wounded during the attack. She probably went into that building to clean her wounds or to perish, only to have the whole building fall upon her uh, at the end of the attack in 1696. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1697, many of the very same settlers that were displaced at Fairland, they return again, they start to fish, and they re start to rebuild once more. However, this effectively marks the end of the Kirk era at Fairland. Now, in all honesty, if it wasn't for the pioneering work of Dr. Jim Tuck, we would know extremely little about life at Fairyland in the 17th century during the Calvert and Kirk eras. Part of the reason, as I said, has to do with the fact that this is the Fairyland settlement is probably the, one of the most poorly historically documented settlements in British North America, but lucky for us, the good trade-off, it's also probably the best preserved and most substantial early English settlement in, in British North America as well. Since the beginning of the large-scale excavations in 1992, Jim also envisioned this project as being a strong community university partnership. So he envisioned this as being uh, an opportunity for local community members in Fairland and adjacent communities to take part in all aspects of this project, everything from excavation and conservation to interpretation and dissemination to the public as well. Jim also envisioned this project as uh, eventually leading to the creation of a nearby interpretation center, complete with a lab, and collections room, as, as well as other heritage attractions associated with life in the 17th century. So things like a kitchen garden, and this is a place where we grow period vegetables, largely based on Edwin Wynne's letters from 1622. We have a herb garden with herbs and medicinal plants, again based on 17th century uh, varieties. And we have a gentleman's garden uh, with symmetrical beds, cobblestone pavements, and again it's a place where we grow uh, period flowers and it's a place for visitors to uh, have a walk around in this and smell flowers in season. We also have a uh, reproduction kitchen, and this is a place obviously uh, with costumed interpreters, and these interpreters basically educate and entertain the public about the trials and the tribulations of life in 17th century Fairyland. I'll also add a little note, uh, all the woodwork that you see here, everything from the paneling to the tables to the chairs uh, to the stools to, and, and everything else, it was all made by Jim. Uh, Jim is a, a quite a master craftsman and a carpenter. All of this stuff was made in oak by hand by Jim, so uh, fantastic testament to uh, his, his skills. Now with regards to what the future of this project brings, 2021 will actually mark the 400 year founding of George Calvert's colony of Avalon. And really it's a great opportunity for all stakeholders to come together. Local stakeholders, university stakeholders, federal and provincial stakeholders, to work together to make this a worthwhile 
uh, celebration and anniversary, the 400 year founding of Calvert's Town of Avalon. In light of this, we are actually very much in, in the planning stages and we hope to achieve a variety of things in 2021. On site, we hope to continue excavations on a small scale, continue to excavate and uncover Calvert's and Kirk's colonies, but we also hope to provide enhanced uh, visitor experiences in the form of both a brew house and bakery and a tavern, both based upon excavated remains found at Fairyland. And again, this would be an opportunity for people to experience the, the sights and the sounds and the tastes and, and the smells associated with life in 17th century Newfoundland, again, based upon our archaeological findings. In the Interpretation Center, we're also hoping to uh, enhance our interpretive programming and education aspects of the site. We want to have a K-12 education center uh, where students from kindergarten to grade 12 can come and learn about archaeology in the province uh, and in some cases highlighting uh, aspects of the archaeology at Fairyland. And at the bottom of a building we hope to uh, make this research center a post-secondary research center so it's a place where uh, researchers from the world over can come and study and research some of our close to two million objects uh, which we haven't covered today over the course of 25 years excavations. If all goes well and we get the money for all this, we hope to name this center here, the James A. Tuck Center for Excellence in Archaeological Research. Finally, to put in an absolutely shameless plug for 2021, uh, <laughs> please consider visiting us either this year or in the future or in 2021 and, and taking part in our, in our plan program. Thank you. Problems? <laughs> Oversights? Issues? Anything? I've got another question. Sure. Um, Sarah Kirk, what became of her? She, she disappeared from the historic records in the early 1680s. So she's in the census records from the 1670s. It shows, she. I think she has like 25 uh, people working under her in terms of fishermen. Uh, after 1680, there's no sign of it. And local legend has it that she died in Fairland and she's buried out on the downs in Fairland, according to local legend. And uh, we haven't been able to confirm that, but uh, no doubt she's. Her three sons have died. No, her three sons, she died well before her three sons. Oh, okay. So she perishes in the 1680s okay. or so, but her sons survive until the French attack. And then all three of those guys perish, essentially again marking the end of the current era. Yeah. Who was the leader of the French attack, by the way? Well, uh, uh, Deberville was yeah, yeah. part of it, and uh, the census name. governor, uh, David Rubinon, as well, he was uh, he was the actual guy who came into Fairyland and leveled the place. Deberville shows up later when all, all the work yeah, was done. They've since done a, uh, a kind of a replica of that march. Uh, my husband took part of it yes, from the, Placentia. Yes, the Overland March. And yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, they did, and then they, they, they rigged up some kind of a ship that they could Burnt out. I remember that 20 years ago. They <laughs> Did you do 20 that? years ago, and they sometimes they burn a boat, sometimes they burn a bunch of wood, sometimes they burn a building. We just make sure we were out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they did take part of that. I haven't seen it in recent years. No, I, have, years. I haven't either, but they all have wore their. Uh, Typical kind of costume because yeah. I remember having to uh, rig one up for uh, Harold when he was going, yeah. and uh, they really, really enjoyed it. The weather with it was great. Uh -huh. but, uh, anyway, probably better than it was when they did over the <laughs> Maybe so. But that yeah. was quite a, that was quite a trek, though. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. yeah, I remember as well when it was, uh, it was a bit of fun when they came by. Yeah, well, I think it was led by uh, I suppose you remember now uh, Patrick. Uh, Oh, I'm his brother anyway, uh, from Carpenter. Patrick. No, no Patrick uh, Hope Flaherty. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it was his brother who, who led it, but anyway, it was quite interesting. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you fill up the plate for Sarah again? Too many slides. Sorry. There we go. I was just wondering if that was a picture of Where? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I really don't know the origins of the plant. The, the thing about these Portuguese plates, there are a variety of different plates produced in Villanova and Portugal with the same kind of floral motifs. So I, I don't suspect there's any direct association with that plant in Newfoundland because I think there are a variety of other ones with similar, similar imagery. Yes. 
Uh, in the Fairyland by Gonzo? Yeah, in around early 1900s. And I always assumed that it came off the red, but I was, I never, nobody ever told me that, I just assumed that. Could it be possible that that was not up around? <laughs> if it was intact, probably not. Uh, most of the stuff we find in the ground is just broken refuse. Well, the, 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 the side plate, I guess you'll call it, is, is cracked. It's, Somebody stuck it together with some nail polish or something. Okay. And uh, the cup and the saucer is, it looks really old. Is there a mark on the bottom of the cup or the saucer? Yeah, that'll give you a hint of the age because there's there's publications on, on Maker's Marks, British Maker's Marks, and continental and European Maker's Marks, 19th century pieces mostly, but uh, yeah, should have brought a hub. I thought you were going to say you had an SK plate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely come to your house for a visit. <laughs> but if I brought it to you, could you tell? Yeah, I, I do my best, and I have I have books with lists of pottery and porcelain makers' marks, particularly nineteenth and twentieth century. So I may be able to come up with a, a an origin for it. You know. Very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I guess if the, you know if Sahara is buried there, there's probably more people buried there in the settlement. I would be, suspect a lot. Yeah, yeah. nothing's been uncovered in terms of who would be. No, and uh, yeah, no. <laughs> we we haven't actively looked for the cemetery. We found some several gravestone fragments, and when I was trying to decide what pictures to show, I didn't show them. But we actually have one near complete one. And we have two other fragments off in the 1620s, but we have yet to find the graveyard. But we're focusing really on the, the settlement part of the site, and the graveyard might be out on the other side of the bridge in the ditch. Yeah. So, uh, but perhaps uh, using certain geophysical techniques, we might catch it. We haven't had much luck with that in the past, but we might find some grave shafts. There's your funding. Yeah. I have to apply for more money. <laughs> uh, all the all the stone used in the masonry and the slate working was that all collected all quarry locally? All local. Uh, there's all sorts of outcrops along the shore, and just I mean, looking at it physically, there's you can not tell the difference between the stuff on the site and the stuff in the quarries. Uh, there's been no elemental trace elements analysis done on it, and and Governor Wayne talks about preparing the quarry, local quarry, and asking for slayers and masons. So the assumption is that it's all local stuff. As opposed to being brought over. Yeah. Did you find much uh, glass, like from wine bottles or? Yes, lots. Yeah. Lots, tens of thousands of pieces. Of oh, stuff. did you? Between wine bottles and wine glasses, yeah. window glass pieces, beads, all sorts of glass objects. Yeah, I took a piece of sea glass away from there and I thought after, I probably shouldn't have, I probably should have brought it up, but I didn't realize, but it's, uh, careful, Steve <laughs> <laughs> are you allowed to take, I mean, I was seeing last lunch, or whatever, and uh, I was just wondering, are you, if you found something, sh should you take anything away from that piece? See, There's, must, that's must, the better must, question. Must, must. <laughs> Thanks for pointing me out, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 that's a very difficult Thing to decide if it's a really worn piece of glass. It really is, and it's the old, old, old green it's, when not, they weren't using any. We can't do a whole pile with that, but if it's a piece of freshly broken glass, then you probably should point it out to the archaeologist because it could, it could indicate there are more pieces of glass or more parts of the site just behind it on the beach yeah. in active erosion, which so, unfortunately uh, happens at Fairly. So if I were out, should I bring that little piece and give it to them? Well, if it's a heavily worn piece of glass, I, it is. Be, I wouldn't be too concerned with it. No, what do you mean heavily worn? Uh, rounded edges, all the edges are nice and smooth and they're beaten smooth. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 So no, don't need to worry? I wouldn't worry okay. about it too much. Because yeah. I, mean, I felt guilty. Problems, in the problems, we're more concerned with protecting our sites and encouraging people to show us what they found. And uh, Yeah. Yeah, a piece of beach glass. That's a big video for it. I know yourself and Jim have been in like dry suits out paddling around a little bit. Has there been much underwater exploration or is there anything proposed maybe in the future of looking? There, there has been. Royce Gaines uh, was there uh, on a couple of occasions and he found a shipwreck right in the pool, mm -hmm. uh, partial remains. And no doubt, I mean, that pool has been used for 500 years or longer. I'm sure it is rotten with fantastic stuff. 
Um, the Fairland Harbor Authority is actually proposing to build a new breakwater around the pool, and we've been in discussions with them as well about you know uh, their archaeological significance and how we have to be there to monitor and keep an eye on things. So. You can imagine that probably served as a dump for 500 years. Every yeah. fisherman and ship people were throwing yes. things overboard. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I remember when they camps. when they cleaned up the Catholic Church, like they it took the marble altar and everything, like everything. Exactly. That's where. Exactly. That's where everything ends up. But no, in that sense, myself and Jim did some work in suits right along the perimeter mm. of the of the site, mm -hmm. but not with snorkels and masks. And, and well, it's quite expensive, I guess, so unless something happens with like the Port Authority, then yeah. there's not much of an opportunity. Yeah, we're going to stay away. And yeah. Underwater archaeology is an expensive business, yeah. so we're going to stay away for now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any questions? Okay. Any okay, thanks everyone. Thanks.